is a speaker, teacher, author, and consultant. She's an undisputed expert on matters of the heart. Prior to writing her new book, The 10 Things to Do When Your Life Falls Apart, she authored 12 books related to love and relationships. Some of her best-selling titles are True Love, The Future of Love, Finding True Love, and The Classic on Psychological Journey of Ending a Relationship Coming Apart. Here is an amazing statistic. Her books have sold over a million copies and have been translated into 15 languages. Here is another very interesting statistic. Daphne and I were talking, and this is maybe the fourth or fifth time she's been at the edge. And here's the um, really amazing one. She has been on Oprah six times. And she's been on hundreds of radio programs, and she's been in magazines and newspaper and articles written about her work. She is also a highly esteemed emotional healer. She's been affectionately dubbed the Einstein of emotions. She counsels people in person and by phone. And we are so fortunate to have Daphne Rose Kingma here today with us. Give her a warm Inside Edge welcome. Thank you so much. I feel very welcome. Whenever I agree to speak at the Inside Edge, I wake up in the morning feeling like a complete lunatic and think, why did I agree to do that again? <laughs> and then every time I arrive and I'm here with you all and I see this sea of beauty and consciousness and willingness and receptivity, I think, now I know why I did. And as Adrienne said in her unforgettable note to me yesterday, it will be a fine morning. <laughs> And I feel that way already just being here. The last time I was here, I remember uh, saying at the end of my talk that I was going to write a book about intimacy because people seem to be so interested in and concerned about that topic. And I didn't write that book. Instead, I ended up writing a book about crisis. And the reason for that is that I'm always instructed by someone to uh, follow their kind of clue to me about what I'm supposed to write about next. And so uh, about a year ago, a gentleman friend of mine from Europe came to see me, and he was going through hell. His wife had left. He lost his job. He uh, had moved to a beautiful apartment, the apartment of his dreams, he said, and had barely gotten settled there. And then they told him they were going to sell it, and he had to move. And he'd also been diagnosed with a kind of degenerative disease that would ultimately be fatal. And he, he kind of cried out to me and said, Daphne, you live in this beautiful place. Can I come and be with you just to unwind and have serenity and digest all this that's happening to me? And so, of course, I said yes, and he came, and we spent a lot of lovely time together. And at the end, as he was preparing to go back home, he we were taking a hike, and he said to me, Daphne, before I leave, can you just tell me the 10 things that I need to do to get through all this? And I remember we were coming down the mountain, and my foot stumbled on a branch, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this guy is, that's the equivalent of writing a book. <laughs> and, and I was really irritated, and by the time I got home, however, the 10 things that he was asking for had already delivered themselves through me. So he is, he is the messenger of what was needed, and I think really the messenger of what these times are. And I was driving someplace the other day, and I saw a bumper sticker that said, if you're not appalled, you haven't been paying attention. And I think that 
is an indicator of what is really true about our world, which is that, in a sense, crisis, the state of crisis, is the new normal. It's like we are operating in, in a state that is not peaceful or serene or, well, it, it is still gracious and it can still be graceful. But when I thought about that, when I thought about that bumper sticker, I, a few days later, in the space of probably an hour and a half, came across the following things. First of all, the statement that since 9-11, we have basically been living in a state of the expectancy of terror. And I was in France last week, and coming home, connecting with a plane to Paris, there was a great delay, half a day's worth of a delay. And when I got home, um, or I guess when I got to Paris, somebody said to me, well, was the delay because of the terror alerts? And everybody said, oh, no, it's not the terror alerts. We're used to that. The delay was because the people were striking about basically what's Social Security in France. And I, that registered so profoundly with me. It's like this is the world that we're living in. Terror alerts are kind of, you know, well, it's just a red alert, no big deal. We're going to get on with whatever we're doing. And yet, like the mosquito buzzing in the corner of the room, this is the kind of energetic field that we're living in. And another thing that happened to me the same day was that I was reading the account by a reporter who'd been traveling across the country sort of checking on the mood of America, Joe Klein, you may know his work, who traveled 6,000 miles and talked to Americans across the country. And what he said he found most significantly from the people that he was talking with was that in general, people are feeling as if America's day is over. That there is a sense among the average person in the average town that our day has come and gone, that we're scrambling back from something, and it may well be that we can't scramble back to the pinnacle of where we formerly experienced ourselves as a world power. And so, he pointed out that there's, again, this kind of feeling of general malaise that people have. It's like, you know, our golden hour is, is fading for us. And then that same day, I read an article about Michael Douglas and how, you know, he's going through this health crisis. And as is often the case, it was he came out of the gate running and said, I'm going to fight this and everything's going to be okay. But is this article... Uh, discussed, it's like, okay, there's this, there is this cloud of acceptance. Maybe this isn't going to be an illness that's defeated. Maybe the chances of survival aren't 60%, but only 20%. And I felt like all of these uh, messages from the world we're really talking about the state that we are living in. We are living in this state of kind of general subtle malaise. We're living in this state of kind of disappointment or an anxiety about our country. And we're also going through personal things that are extremely challenging. And so this is a time in which crisis is the new normal. And it's, it's of course, the beauty of it, as I want to explore with you this morning, the beauty of it is that it's an incredible opportunity. And of course, we don't always see that, don't always see it that way, but that is the possibility that lies within it. So just for the sake of clarity, what is a crisis anyway? I mean, I think we all know when you meet up with a crisis, you know you're in it. But the qualities of it are that somehow you feel like you are in a situation or a circumstance which is beyond your control. It's bigger than you are. It can be just one thing which is so huge and devastating that you don't know how you'll get through it, or it can be a whole stack of things. It was interesting to hear what people were talking about at our tables this morning, you know, for, for 
some, it was that one devastating moment that became a life-turning event. But sometimes it's just the this and the that on top of it and the that on top of that that makes an experience where we feel incredibly out of control. And the difficulty with it is that crisis always taps into our emotional being. We are profoundly emotional beings. And when we hit something that feels bigger than we know how to handle, we're suddenly thrust into feelings that are very unfamiliar to us. And many years ago, Michael was reminding me of a book I wrote called Coming Apart about living through the end of a relationship. And the thing that always people say about that particular crisis is suddenly I was in this tidal wave of feelings that I had no idea how I was going to deal with. So we are emotional beings, but we are not very conversant with our emotional repertoire. And a crisis throws us, slams us against the wall into arenas that we don't have the, the muscular emotional preparation for. And it's devastating. And, and one of the things that's so challenging about it is that we, we usually handle difficulty by attempting to get control. This is the sort of, you know, the legacy of the male control um, kind of consciousness that we've been living in culturally. It's like, well, if it's tough, do more, or get control of it, or beat it. It's like all of these very aggressive responses that we have <clears throat> about how to handle what is, in fact, emotionally taking us apart at the seams. And so the notion of feeling deeply about what we're going through, the notion of sitting down and having a good ball, which actually is one of the 10 things I not only suggest, but urgently recommend in this book, is sort of the last thing that we think of. We live, we live in a culture of denial. We live in a culture that says we can do anything, have anything, accomplish anything. And so the notion of surrendering or the notion of literally being taken apart by something is very scary to us. And there's a kind of shame that goes along with um, dealing with something difficult, as if we've made a terrible mistake that some challenging situation has arrived in our life. And I think it's, it's a peculiarly even American thing which says, um, you know, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's almost as if we have embedded in our unconscious the notion that somehow always everything should be all right. It's like, it's supposed, it's supposed to be all right. And therefore, one of the very challenging things about a difficult time is that we can get very easily into this self-blaming thing, that the feelings of shame that come up. Why didn't I figure this out in advance? Why am I not able to master it? What am I going to do now to explain to people that this has happened to me? As if somehow we brought it on ourselves. And so dealing with these feelings is very, very challenging because it takes us into parts of ourselves that many of us aren't conversant with. And then a crisis is also huge for us because it, it takes us into uncomfortable spiritual waters, too. We get to the place of feeling spiritually abandoned. It's like, you know, what is the universe saying to me that this ill fortune has fallen on me? Has God, whatever people hold that as in their consciousness, why has God forsaken me? You know, it's the cry of Job. How can all this stuff be happening to me? Why me? Why now? It's like we don't have a category in our consciousness that really allows for the, the dark time, for the crisis of faith. And so once again, we're thrown up against things in ourselves that we don't usually visit. And so 
when we go through difficult times, it's just incredibly, it's incredibly challenging. And what's really interesting about crises is that, you know, it's the event that happened, it's the broken relationship, it's the illness, it's the fire in the house, it's the whatever. And we tend, first of all, to respond simply on a practical level, which of course you have to. If your house is burned down, which my mind did a number of years ago, you do have to get up and start dealing with it. You have to call the insurance people and you have to become a building contractor and you have to see it through. But there's a tendency to say, okay, I'm gonna do all this stuff and then the terrible thing will fade away and I'll be done with it. And that is a very critical moment because it's the moment of opportunity. It's the moment in which the windows and doors of consciousness can start to break open and you can say, ah, possibly there's more to this experience than simply getting back to what was. Possibly there is an opportunity here for transformation. And of course, when you're standing beside the charred ruin of your house, as I was a number of years ago. You're not thinking about transformation. You're not thinking about what a fabulous opportunity this is and all the great things that are going to become of you as a consequence of this. And we heard that even in the little bits of stories we told each other this morning. And so that is one of the things that makes these difficult moments extra profoundly difficult because whatever the ultimate outcome may be, the beautiful endings that we told each other about the very hard stories that we all went through, you're not saying at the beginning, oh, of course this is going to have a fabulous ending, of course I'm going to be transformed and enlarged by this because it's the very nature of the crisis that you must go through it blindly, in a sense. You must go through it without any hope whatsoever that there will be a beautiful outcome, because it's the very going through it, it's the very musculature of going through the experience and what becomes of us as we do that, that actually creates the possibility of the outcome. And if you don't stand at that moment and be willing to go through the process, then the outcome of transformation will not be available to you. And I, I think this is one of, the, one of the very frightening things, and sometimes I think it's good to scare ourselves, because um, I always say about myself, I respond well to threats. <laughs> and what I mean by that is when I get really scared, I'm willing to take the risk of taking action. And, and sometimes it takes that for us to take action. And that is, of course, one of the functions in, of crisis in our life. It, it is this, it's this profound thumbtack on the seat of our soul that says, okay, it hurts to sit down, so you better stand up and get moving. And so we, we get in, into this state of, of thinking that, okay, I'm going to practically solve this problem, and then it's going to be done. And I, I'm working with somebody right now who's going through the most horrendous divorce with, with a person who clearly is a sociopathic personality, and if you don't know what that is, I hope you don't personally have a chance to find out, but it's a person who at the deepest level of their being has absolutely no reference for right and wrong, and therefore is capable, capable with a smile on their face of accomplishing any evil deed a human being could do. And this woman keeps saying, well, you know, he was like that all the years of our marriage, but now maybe in the divorce he'll be kind and nice. And, you know, maybe when he realizes he's losing me, he'll be kind and nice and he'll have the wake up. And, and you know, my continuing message is don't expect it. This isn't in the cards. And so one of the things I think that is a gift to remember in your own time of crisis is that we have an opportunity 
not, not every person will take the opportunity. And, and it's, it's true of each of us. There's a moment of choice about how we will hold what we're going through. Will we hold it as a violation of the gods on our life and why should I have to be going through this? Or as we go through the excruciating process, will we begin to hold it as the opportunity for transformation, not even knowing what that transformation might be. And I think that's the critical thing. When the process is dark, when you feel like you're never going to get through it, when you don't imagine there could possibly be a positive outcome, to simply abide in that place that says something amazing could happen here, even though it is completely invisible at the moment. So. When you're going through these difficult things, of course there is the practical reality that has to be dealt with, and sometimes it's absolutely grueling. It's absolutely demanding. You don't know how you're gonna drive to the hospital one more day. You don't know how you're going to talk to the insurance company one more day. You don't know how you're going to sit through one more conversation with your ex-person until you can separate that relationship but the truth is, the practical reality does have to be dealt with, and it opens to the emotional possibilities of the situation. And that is, one of the great opportunities here is for emotional growth. And it's amazing to me, I'm going to put a little parenthesis in here, I can't resist. My little parenthesis is this. I've been working with people emotionally for decades, and what has blown me away in recent years is that after the last century of a zillion self-help books, you know, all this enlightenment, everybody's figuring everything out, how to have a relationship and how to have your dreams come true and how to make all the money you could possibly never spend in 10 lifetimes, that what I have observed recently with people, the people that I'm working with and the people that show up for workshops and stuff, is how receding people's emotional awareness of themselves is. That was a little bit of a cumbersome sentence. Let me say it in another way. People aren't nearly as emotionally savvy now as they were 15 or 20 years ago. Present company accepted, <laughs> truly accepted. But it has blown me away to see that the most simple emotional transactions or the most simple basic concepts or, or awareness of how people, how a self, how yourself is ticking emotionally is something that is just wildly eluding people right now. And I, I believe the reason for that is that, you know, in the recent times, we've, we've, this is such a cliche, I can't even believe I'm gonna say it, but you know, we're living in this virtual world, everybody's meeting everybody and doing everything in the cyber reality. And, and so we have access to everything except ourselves. And, and it's not that, it's just a very subtle thing. It's like we are drawn outward. We are drawn to the feasts that Google can give us as opposed to the internal life that's so easy to avoid. It's, it's just like, you know, when you're in the candy store, you want candy, but if you're not in the candy store, maybe you don't. Maybe you're content to sit with yourself. And so I bring this up at such length because in a way more than ever before, human beings need crisis simply to become self-aware. It's like we're just willing to walk off into the cyber sunset without getting acquainted with ourselves because nothing is asking us to do that. And my most, maybe not most, but right up there, passionate belief is that human 
living experience, the human life, is a journey of emotional and spiritual evolution. That is what we're doing here. We're not doing here to collect more stuff. We're doing here to come deeply into the awareness of ourselves, to know who we are, to respond with the, the rich repertoire of our emotions to the rich repertoire of our life experience, and thereby to have this astonishing experience of aliveness. And <laughs> thank you. And you know, it's, it's amazing to just consider that it really is our emotions that give us this sense of our aliveness. It's not the possessions that we have, it's who we experience ourselves as being when we are engaged in the events of life. This is why we love powerful, beautiful movies, because we get to feel. We get to feel that life is a rich experience. It's more than just taking out the trash and putting the socks away. It's, it's we feel our, our humanity, the vibrancy of our humanity. And so, the gift of a crisis is therefore that we have an opportunity to check in with ourselves. Who is the person who's living this life? Who is the person that's now, you know, slammed up against the wall and wondering how to get through this experience? What does this person feel? What is this person affected by? What is important to this self that's having this experience? And so, it's such a profound moment of self-awareness, of self-consciousness in the very best sense of that word. And one of the things that, that I've written about in this book and that I think is so terribly important is that we each have a life story that we're unraveling through our human experience. And I call that a life theme. There are a number of life themes they all have to do with difficulties that we've experienced, and they become themes because they're repeated throughout our life. There, there's something that happens in childhood. Your father was killed in the war. You then went to school, and your best friend moved away, and then you got engaged, and your lover left you. And so there's a theme that's developed. It's not just a single event, but it, a theme has this oh yeah, that's the way my life is kind of feeling to it. And we all have these themes, and they're all profoundly affecting, and they're all about some sorrowful or difficult or tragic experience that we had. And so our life emotionally is an unwinding of this theme. And because these themes are instated when we're very young, we develop ways of coping with them. The truth is that none of us would be here if we just took the assault of our life theme without developing some sort of coping behavior because our hearts would be broken and we would be madmen. We wouldn't be able to deal with it. So we do deal with it. We, we develop all sorts of behaviors that become the way that we navigate through life. Now, the great beauty of a crisis is that it invites us to look at this. Who am I? What happened to me? Why am I responding this way? Why is my response to this circumstance, this terrible thing that's happened, you know, my house is burned down, but what I want to do is sit on the couch and watch TV. I do not want to call the insurance people, and as a matter of fact, I've always distracted myself, and so that's what I feel like doing now, and maybe it'll all take care of itself. That's the example of what I call a default behavior. And a default behavior, it's kind of an interesting word because it has that fault in it, but it really isn't about fault. It's like on your computer when you, you know, you don't pick the gorgeous typeface you want your paper to come out in, and it just comes out in Times Roman because that's the default printer face. So defaults, our personal emotional defaults, are these things that show up when we're not conscious, when we don't consciously say, 
This circumstance is asking me to awaken to how I might respond in a way that's different from the knee-jerk, always, well, I always do it this way or I've always gotten through it that way. It's a moment of explosive self-awareness opportunity to say, okay, let's stop and look at myself here. And, and the beautiful thing about this stopping and looking is that it's not just, okay, my habitual response may not be very effective, which is one level and a very important level. It's like, okay, maybe I need to do something differently here. But it's also an incredible opportunity for self-compassion because when we go deeply into who we are, when we go deeply into how we were affected as children, we, we have an opportunity to look at ourselves with compassion and to say, wow, it's amazing I'm here. It's amazing I made it through. It's amazing that in my genius, I developed a way of surviving this story that was my life story. And, you know, it may sound a little dramatic to say that, but it really is true of all of us. If you are here today, it's because in some ingenious way you found a way to survive what could have been unbearable. I have a friend, a very dear friend, who's a very gifted healer, and he cannot read or write. He's one of the smartest people I know, and he has sat with me often. He, he used to say to me, the thing I really want to do with you is I want to sit with you one day at your computer while you're writing, because I want to see how that all works. And he sat with me, and unable to read the words, he is so kinesthetically brilliant that he took his hand and put it on the computer screen and said, I don't know why, but I think something's wrong with that sentence. And so just as we've seen people that can play the piano with their toes and people who can paint with paintbrushes in their teeth, my friend developed a compensatory behavior that was so brilliant that he could energetically feel when something was the matter with a sentence that I wrote. Now, that's really the other side of the coin, which is that when we look at ourselves with compassion, then we also look at how we have survived and the beauty in us that survived and the genius in us that survived. And of course, that becomes something that we can draw on when we're in a time of crisis. We see our habitual behaviors, but we also get to see our genius. And so, in a very amazing way, instead of being something that takes you down to the nubs, a crisis can be an opportunity to claim yourself, to become yourself more. And in fact, I think my uncle Johannes always used to say we're, we're a very stubborn species, you know. And, and I think what he meant is we don't usually learn unless we're, you know, unless we're challenged unless something is really uncomfortable. And so the point of this opportunity is to take it and to take it in, in the sense of really saying, what can I discover about myself now? What can I discover about this amazing, unique being who is me? Because so much of the time we're just kind of floating through life and functioning in all the ways that we must. And so this is an invitation to yourself in a very beautiful and wonderful way. And the other great opportunity, I believe, in a crisis is that we get to grow spiritually. And spiritual growth, I loved what you said, Christy, that spiritual growth is your priority now. And I, I think that's true of everyone in this room, whether we would state that consciously or not. We are aware, as has been said so often in recent times, we're aware of the fact that we're spiritual beings. 
Um, I'm a little tired of that phrase, actually. It's been thrown around so much. But what does that really mean? What does that really mean? How do we enact that? What, what does that look like and act like and behave like? And the great, amazing thing about a crisis is that it very often has the effect of just breaking us through to a kind of spiritual consciousness that we don't usually arrive at. Sometimes we don't arrive at it even, you know, in the, the daily practice of a spiritual practice. It's like one of my friends said to me, you know, my crisis gave me the enlightenment that sitting in a cave for 14 years would have done. You know, it's like suddenly we get to be aware. Suddenly we see the relationship of everything to everything. Suddenly we see that we're not alone. And, and there's a kind of emotional and spiritual crossover here because on an emotional level, when we're suffering, we reach out to other people. We, we suddenly realize that we're not gods in our own life and we don't have everything handled. But we suddenly realize that we're connected and that we need to be connected. We need to be comforted. We need to comfort. And so this rich part of our humanity that is our capacity to love starts showing up. And I, I was at a gathering recently that was kind of a replay of a gathering a year before. And there was a woman there who um, I had remembered introducing herself, just a total powerhouse of a woman. I thought, wow, this woman's got fabulous energy. You know, she's out there really doing the world. And I greeted her, and she said, you know, since this last year, I have been taken down to the nubs. She, she was hit injured in a hit-and-run accident, and she said, you know, I have had to ask for the first time in my life. I couldn't get up off the couch to go to the bathroom. I had to be in this humble, desperate place of saying, will you help me? Will you be here for me? Will you love me? And she said that this experience had been the most transforming ever of her life, you know. And when we have these experiences, it's like, all of the things we've achieved suddenly go out the window. They are not important. What is important is that somebody will show up at your door and take you to the bathroom. And so that's the emotional possibility that exists. And then that also spills over into the spiritual possibility, which is that we get confronted with our depth we get invited to see our depth. We get invited to have transcendent, miraculous experiences. And I tell the story in the book of a woman who was, her husband showed up one day and said, I'm leaving you, and was gone the next day. And in the wake of his departure, she found out that he had basically been a criminal for years and was under arrest and state after state after state. And, you know, it was such a psychic shattering of, you know, who am I? Who is this person? How can I never have understood this? What, what is real? What, what do I need to know? And she said it was just like a complete meltdown and that the whole world changed for her. And in a way, she began to, you know, the very molecular structure of reality, if you will, started melting. And she felt like she was living in two worlds at once and she could see through the veil, as the saying goes. And that she said, sometimes I would walk on the street and it would just be filled with light. And it was like she was literally lifted out of the ordinary dimensions of human experience and given through this psychically shattering wound, an opportunity to see, if you will, the structure of the universe. And so we don't go around every day saying, well, I really want to see the structure of the universe, <laughs> you know, lay it on me, because we are so engaged with life as it is. And so we, we don't ask for that, and we're not given it. But the gift of a crisis is that it opens that doorway for you. And 
it really behooves you to say yes when that door is opened because it's an incredible opportunity. And so whatever, whatever is going on, whatever point of pain or point of difficulty or ongoing experience of difficulty that you're going through, the importance is not that you're going through it, that it showed up in your life, or the importance is not even that you're going to get through it and everything's going to get back to normal. The importance is that this is an opportunity for transformation. And even if you don't want the transformation, and even if you can't imagine what it would possibly look like, how could it possibly turn out to be something better? The really important thing is that you ask for that, that you ask that something in you be changed because it's just amazing what can happen. And it won't happen unless you are steadfast on that journey. And, and as you know, as we all know, going through the journey is really grueling. I, I told the story of how my house burned down a number of years ago, and it was really grueling. Every day was a day of very committed attention to get through this ordeal. But there's a, there's a direct and exquisite relationship between your willingness to be steadfast in going through the ordeal and getting the prize of transformation that awaits you. And so really all of the difficulties that are given to us are purposeful. It's not like, well, how did this show up on my doorstep and, gee, everything was going along great and why did this have to happen? It's like this happened, the this, whatever the this is, this happens exactly and precisely so that we can advance and evolve and become. And the real core of all this becoming, whether it's on an emotional level or a spiritual level, is to really connect with the love that is us. Because we are love. That's what, that's what it ultimately means to be a spiritual being. I'm so sick of that word. Sorry. It's just so worn out, isn't it? I want to put wings or feathers on it or something to, you know, bring it back. We are, you know, we are light, illumined, transformed, eternal, amazing, indivisible beings that are connected with all of us and all of it. And that's what we have an opportunity to see. And it's that, it's that energy that is love. Love is energy. And I was... The other day, I, I was feeling, love is a fissionable material. That phrase came to my mind. And what fissionable means is it means a single atom can be split to create millions of electronic charges that fill the sky with light, and that's who we are. And so the opportunity here is to taste of that, to experience that, to some degree, that in the ordinary moments of your life, when everything's going great, you will never have a chance to see. That's the gift that awaits you. And in closing, I would just like to read a, a poem that I wrote to kind of express this. I am a sometime poet, and sometimes the poem wants to be read. It's called The Journey. In the heart of these times, these very difficult times, lies your heart, held in the hand of eternity. You have arrived here not by accident, but by appointment. Yourself asked for this. Your hands, grinding the whetstone of preparation, have been leaning toward this 
since you were born. What is it asking this mountain of rubble at your doorstep, this heart broken for the thousandth time? What is it offering you in return? No path you are given or walk on is mistaken. We are here to become who we always were, whole, new, alive, transformed. And if there is a meaning to this, which there is, it is that slogging through thickets and halos of pain, we arrive at the one destination that gathers us all like a small lamb into its arms. Compassion, that is the name of this city, and gratitude, its ravaged suburb where any refugee can find home, and you too, wandering through the dark hours, can find the reason you came here and feel the cool wind of blessing, which given is also always received. Come then to the garden in the parking lot, the lily blooming in the trash heap, and I will meet you there. We all will meet you. For there is where all of us begin and end, where we know that love is who we are. Thank you.